Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Listen Gallery and our beautiful presentation of works, paintings, and drawings by Joanna Pousset Dart. We're delighted that you're all here. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments before we start. Fong, please don't leave. We really louder, louder. You're saying louder. Okay, cool. Louder. Um, just wanted to make a few comments before we start, and that is um, basically the format of our afternoon is 40 minutes. Uh, Joanna and Fong will be having a dialogue, a conversation, and then afterwards we'll have about 15 minutes, uh, maybe 20, we'll see, for questions. Um, and before we start, I'd just like to make a few comments. Introduction, I don't think they really need an introduction, nonetheless. Uh, Joanna Pousset Dart was born in New York, where she still lives and works. She has a BA from Bennington College, Vermont. This is the gallery's first solo presentation with Joanna, following our recent announcement of representation, which we are very, very thrilled to be doing. Our first exhibition with Joanna was here at 10th Avenue in 2017. Aspects of Abstraction, which featured Joanna alongside Marina Adams, Paul Feely, and Leon Pogsmith. Her work was the subject of solo exhibition at Wiesbaden Museum, Germany, just last year. We have catalogs and we are giving them out free today. I hope we have enough, we might not, um, for those of you who'd like one, and maybe if you get lucky, Joanna will sign it for you. We may not have enough. I just got into trouble. <laughs> so first come, first serve. Um, Locke's Gallery in Philadelphia will open a solo exhibition of new work next month. Opens on April 3rd, is that correct? Okay. Fong Bui is an artist, writer, independent curator, publisher, and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail. The arts newspaper published an excellent interview between Joanna, I can hear it's going in and out, I apologize, and Barbara Rose in June of last year. And we look forward to the continuation of that discussion and exploration into Joanna's work here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you guys hear us OK? OK. Um, thanks for being here. As uh, Jeannie said, that we're going to talk no more than 40 minutes, and I hope that you will raise questions and participate, uh, because I really find it very difficult to mediate her work in every way. But um, yes, coming here, I was thinking how, unlike the works of many artists I know, you know, um, where potential dialogue or whatever creating the conversation about the work, surrounding the work, uh, were all possible, but it's impossible to do the same with Johanna's work. Um, I don't know how uh, that is, but I did have a privilege to carry a show of her large painting, despite of it, in 2007 at MoMA PS1, when I was a curatorial advisor there. Since then, we became good friends. I spent a lot of time in the studio, looking at the works, talking about the work with Johanna, but still, having been here just now, 10 minutes ago, looking around the work, I hope that I would have some fresh insights, some new responses that I would like to share with you before we get the pleasure um, to hear directly from Johanna. Um, first of all, when I think of Johanna's work, I think how our imagination had its own history as yet unwritten, and it has its own geography, and yet only barely dimly seen. Imagination, according to one of our favorite, my favorite author, um, Guy Davenport, in his geography of imagination, is like a drunk man who lost his watch, and he must get drunk again to find it. Um, <laughs> Imagination is a friend of history, as space is a friend of time. And I was also thinking of 
the notion of largeness in relation to the complexity of smallness. You know how sensation can play trick with your sense of scale. For example, imagine you stand on top of the Himalayas. You absorb the vista, the immensity of nature, the scene below you, surrounding you, but you have a twinge of pain. The twinge of pain is nothing. The vista is overwhelming. But if the pain can easily overtake, can overwhelm the sense of immensity. And that's a, not a bad play to begin, Joanna, because I always have fascination of your sense of scale. And I wonder whether scale is different than size and proportion for you. Uh. Yeah, I think that scale is very different from size and proportion. I think that scale is something, I mean, something very small can have immense scale, and something very large can have no scale at all. You know, I think mm -hmm. that, um, I think scale has a lot to do with how something is put together. I think it's a mysterious thing, but yeah. I think that when, um, uh, the parts are put together in a particular way, mm -hmm. something achieves scale. I think all the elements of something have to be integrated and, and working together yeah. for something to achieve, really, a sense of scale. But, you know, I find that I, uh, you know, I, I work differently on different scales. I, I like to work on a large scale much better than I like working on a small scale. Yeah. Um, I, I work on the small scale sometimes to figure things out and also because I'm interested in the idea of being able to kind of, um, you know, telescope a yeah. kind of space, you know. Um, and I also like the dialogue between small, the smaller works and the larger works. I, like, I often in my studio have things, you know, small things near large things. And it's like zooming in and out, you know, of, yeah. of space for me. Right. Um, but the, there's something uh, also about the way it relates to the human body, I think, you know, the scale. Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons that I love to work larger, because I can you know, the, the, the kinds of ways that one creates the shapes and the gestures, it just feels mm -hmm. natural. You know, all these things are almost within, you know, reach. You know, I, I, sometimes I have to get up on a ladder, but, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're really about, you know, what I can reach. And, yeah. and, and, and they're also, um, the paintings are very much about um, having a feeling of, for me, what I would yeah, like them yeah, to be, anyway, yeah. is I would like them to feel as though the viewer were somehow present in them. So, so scale becomes important in that sense. Yeah. How how does the oh, how does all the well, all the elements, Joanna, like drawing, the color, does that come to be an integral part in the process of determining? how the shape of the canvas will be? In other words, do you make preparatory study for them before? One, because once you make the shape, you, yeah. you have to yeah. work within that's that right. structure. That's right. It's a, it's, and that's the difference between the large things that I make and the small things. Mm. The large things um, are, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I kind of make them from very loosely, they're very loosely conceived from drawings, notebook drawings and things, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if I showed you a notebook drawing that I took, say, this painting from, you would say, what? You know, you wouldn't, yeah. you probably wouldn't see an immediate relationship. But it, it's, it gives me um, a sort of a blueprint, you know, if you will, for, for what I want the piece to be. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then I translate it to the wall on, on paper. I put big paper up on the wall. And, um, and that trans, you know, when, once I, tr that translation is a very sort of laborious for me because it, um, it's the place that everything is sort of fine-tuned. And 
I find that the very incremental changes in the curvature yeah. or, you know, um, very small shifts and things make a, a dramatic change. And, mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, I give this drawing and to the person that makes, that constructs the panels. Yeah. He uses it as a template. So, so they're very, um, you know, they're kind of idiosyncratic. You know, they, they're as, they, they have, a, they're not strictly geometric. So hopefully, I mean, my, my feeling is that I want to keep them um, a bit like the drawings, you know. I want, I want the idiosyncrasies of the yeah. drawings to come into the painting. So this well, in, in the I'm recent thinking. interview with Barbara Rose, yeah. um, you shared the two kind of drawing, the one that you make mm -hmm. more or less in reference to the painting, mm -hmm. and then the other kind where it was totally spontaneous and improvisational. Yeah, very uh, So how do they, do they intersect occasionally? Um, well, not at all. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they, they really do a lot. They intersect, but not in a one-to-one -one way, yeah. you yeah. know? I mean, I, I find, um, you know, sometimes I go through periods where I don't draw very much at yeah. all, you yeah. know? And yeah. um, it, I'm just completely invested in the painting. Yeah. And, um, but I find that the times when I do draw and you know I mean sometimes I'll, it'll be when I'm waiting or I just don't know what I'm doing and I just want to take some time off and I yeah, yeah. I find those periods just you know incredibly um, helpful yes. in, 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 the, in, the, in the progress of the works yeah. um, because it's they're completely intuitive and I've said before in places you know to me they're they're really they're like dreaming yeah. You know, yeah. and so, and I don't, you know, there are no, when you work on a physical thing that's large and stuff, you know, they're just all these um, impediments, you know, yeah. there, it's not, it's not as immediate. And, and when you're drawing, you know, yeah. you can do anything at any moment and it's just, and, yeah. and you can throw it away. <laughs> yeah. Or you can, you know, um, or you can go on with it if it isn't what you, what you want it to be. So. It's, it, and, and you can try, of course, many, many, many things, you yeah. know, yeah. that would be more difficult to try in a, in a larger scale. So they're very, they're very important um, yeah. to me. You yeah. know. Um, in the interview you did, um, actually John did, John Waterman, who's yes. here, um, <laughs> the Rails Editor at Large in 2008 for the show you had with now defunct gallery. Yeah. Um, Hassan, the gallery, and I remember being struck about the coincidence of the reference to the Native American of Northwest uh, Coast, Coastal Tribe, mm. um, and I think something that your father had also invested. That's true. Equal he, interest as well. Yeah, yeah. He he was, um, you know, he had. Um, as I think many artists of his generation, he collected, um, or I shouldn't say collected, he didn't collect in a kind of a, a normal, you know. Um, I, he, 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 came, he came by things, and it was a time when you could actually, you know, there was tons of antique shops up and down First and Second Avenue, and. Yeah. You could buy things for nothing, you know. You could buy, and we were all, we all live, we, we all wish we could have lived then because it was, you know, you could go in and buy a, an African piece or, a, you know, or, 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 you know, a Northwest Coast piece or a pre Columbian piece or this or that for nothing, you yeah, know. Yeah. And um, I mean, I can remember my father, you know, bargaining for, for pieces which were, you know, like, Fifty dollars, you know. No, I, I don't have fifty dollars, you know. And then, and then going back and back and back until he got the person down to thirty-five or something like that. So there were there were a lot of you know he, there were a lot of objects like that around the, mm -hmm. the studio, and mm -hmm. and he was clearly you know at a, you know for, from the thirties and forties into the fifties, and I think you could make the case that you know even even longer, he was very involved with these totemic forms. And, yeah. and um, so, you know, that's embedded in here somewhere, you know, certainly. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the way 
and as as is uh, a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. that, that, I mean, uh, you know, it's so hard when people say, well, what are you, what, what are, what are, what are the things that are, what are your inspirations? And I mean, my God, you know, it's kind of, it would be hard to, to enumerate them all because there's so many things that I think about and, yeah. um, you know, in the work, um, uh, you know, from, from Chinese landscape painting, um, all sorts of, you know, I mean, I love, uh, you know, there's so many fresco cycles which have been, yeah. you know, in, in, incredibly important to me. Um, Islamic stuff, yeah. calligraphy, and, and, you know, it's interesting, I think, when one looks at their, their own work over long periods of time, you know, you can kind of see certain things which follow all the way through, certain kinds of things that are of interest that follow all mm -hmm. the way through, even though the for form of your work might change yeah. a great deal. Mm -hmm. so. Well, with the same interview, it wasn't that you repudiate that reference, the same thing with American Indian mm -hmm. space painter like mm -hmm. Steve Wheeler and yeah. Peter Busso, or even yeah. early Will Burnett, but it somewhat formulated the very beginning when you were in Galisteo, mm -hmm. New Mexico, where the reference to the landscape, the mm -hmm. body, bodily response to it, yeah. was the very much the beginning of how the shape canvas was being yeah. um, made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, 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 the shapes themselves came out of a very personal, you know, um, reaction to a, a physical, physical sort of situation. And um, in a funny way, uh, even, I mean, even though I had spent a lot of time in the, in the Southwest, um, mm -hmm. various locations really since the 70s, since, yeah. uh, since the mid-70s, and it had um, informed my work over that period of time in, yeah. in many different ways. Yeah. I, I had a kind of, um, I, I, you know, I don't know, a kind of an epiphany, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. in this in this one place. Yeah. It, it, I, what I want somehow it clarified to me um, what what I what I what was important to me, yeah. and then it became how can I um, how can I give that form? Yeah. You know, how can I how can I make that happen? So I knew what. What I wanted to make happen, but I didn't really know yet how, how what what form it was going to take. You yeah, know? Yeah. And, um, and what year was this? Joanna? This was Pacific? in the in the in the nineties. Mm -hmm. You know, in the nineties. Ninety early nineties. Um, yeah. yeah. No. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That it was the early nineties, and and so I, um, you know, I I. I I had a camera, mm -hmm. and I uh, was living in this house that had, a, it was a berm house, it was built into the side of a hill, and you could stand on the roof, and you had this amazing sort of 360 degree yeah. view of this, you know, in, you know immense uh, mm -hmm. space with, yeah. you know, all these mountain ranges, and, you know, there was just something going on every second, you know. Yeah. And, and I just began taking these, you know, uh, s snapshots and, and then pasting them together, taping them together. Very, they were very primitive. I mean, you know, but they, yeah. but, you know, the idea was, to, they, all, they all went like this, you know, but yeah. the idea was to get the image all the way through 360 degrees. Yeah. And when I did that, you know, it was just, I was, you know, I was astounded because it, with the light changes were just so radical within like two or three shots of one another. Everything, everything looked different, you know, yeah. everything looked different. The sky, and the earth interchanged, you know? I yeah. mean, it was just everything. So it wasn't separated. Or it wasn't separated, or what was dark became light, you know, like, I mean, the, the, the clouds would get dark, and then the earth would get light, and then in the next couple of shots, it would reverse, yeah. you know? Yeah. And what was shadow would become, you know, uh, uh, feel solid because yeah. of the light, yeah. and, and vice versa. So it was just yeah. this very fluid, kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. exciting, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and 
puzzling and strange and you know yeah. astonishing kind of place. It was really so it's like a kind of a drawing lesson, yeah. you know, yeah. is what it was. It was like a big drawing lesson. Yeah. And um, so when I would put these together, these shapes started emerging, you know, from mm -hmm. you know, they, you know, they, and um, and I, and then I began making cutouts of, you know, from paper, and yeah. um, and then the first the first paintings um, were basically there were hemis there were total hemispheres, you know. Sometimes I would. You know, alter something a tiny bit, but they were. It was basically a hemisphere, and then a second one sitting on top of it. So they met kind of on uh -huh. a tangent, mm -hmm. and um, all of the linear drawing in the painting would kind of unravel from that kind of place where they met. Yeah. And so, but it was a very, um, like you know, I, I made a bunch of those paintings, and then I decided that. Um, that that I wanted to that I wanted to deal more that I wanted to create a different space to paint within. So yeah. I began flattening those mm -hmm. hemispheres, mm -hmm. and then you know I got to these shapes, which I guess you know people say, oh, you know, they're canoes or they're boats or yeah. or whatever, but really they're flattened, you know, they're flattened. They're more or less. I mean, they're based on these sort of flattened hemispheres, you know. Yeah. And, um, and, and that kind of allowed me to, um, you know, really change the content of the drawing within the painting, you yeah. know, because it made a bigger area that I could, you know, I could work on. Yeah. Um, well, this, le this lead to my next burning question, which is something that, that we all learn in, in art school, you know, that you, you, one learns that the straight line usually imply to man-made form. You know, in order to make the straight line that generate a form, you have to connect it them. It's like an architectural exercise in a way where the curved line implies and associated with natural form to nature. Um, so I wonder what your work prior to this, was it rectilinear abstraction, I take it, which no one ever talked about it? Yeah, well... Uh, what was kind of work you were doing leading to this, Joanna? Uh, so I, the work went through, you know, yeah. we're talking about a lot of years. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it went through a lot of changes. Um, but, uh, it, okay, so I, the first work that I did in the early 70s, this is like right out of, you know, I, I was pretty much right out of college. Yeah. And they were the first serious paintings that I felt like I ever did. And they were, um, you know, I was really interested in all these people who were um, working, like at Park Place Gallery, you know, people that were really, mm -hmm. you know, examining what a painting could be, you know, that it mm -hmm. didn't have to be this, that it could be an object, that it could be, you know, they were taking, they were, they were really trying to examine all the different possibilities. And so that was, you know, that interested me. That's, you know, I, that's kind of what I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, so the first paintings were these paintings that didn't, they were unstretched, they were very irregular. They were um, sort of woven out of six pieces of canvas that were very roughly cut and they, uh, so they were woven so that they, it was a very soft grid. Yeah. And they were stiff, and you hung them from, they had grommets on the back. And they were, um, they were sand, yeah. you know? They yeah. were like sand paintings. This was before I ever got to New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. But I sort of felt like I, I wanted to make something that, that was very organic, you know, yeah. and, um, and built, mm -hmm. you know? And um, and then uh, I went to New Mexico in in the, in the mid '70s, and I decided to begin stretching those. And because I got once I went there, I literally it's like I saw the light. <laughs> you yeah, know, I mean yeah. the the color, 
and and everything just became a, a kind of yeah. a real major interest. Yeah. And so I, I I stretched them and and that grid got strangely enough it got much harder you know yeah. much much yeah. more much more regular um, because it you know I guess I needed a container I needed an organizer yeah. for for all of these in, you know color and light impulses yeah. so so the sand stayed I, they, they were this they were made out of many layers of sand and and color oh. I would put a layer of sand and then I would brush it with brush it very lightly and yeah. then I would put another layer so they had this very kind of velvety uh -huh. because it was very very fine sand huh. and they had a very velvety quality and um, and uh, and they were multi Panels. They were multi-panel. Well, sometimes they were. Sometimes they were six square, six foot squares, seven foot squares, seven by fourteen. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and uh, and in a funny way, uh, yeah. Anyway, they were so, so. Those were very much about color. You know, yeah, and, yeah. I um, see. Very much about the color. Um, I never seen any one of them. Well, they were. Where do you, where can find them? They were all shown at uh, you know when I was showing at Susan Caldwell. You yeah. know, I showed at Susan Caldwell with um, you know David Reed and mm -hmm. Sean Scully and mm -hmm. you know David Novros and you know. Uh, you have any one? Swain. You and, save any of them? Oh yeah, I do. I have some. Okay, so next time uh, <laughs> we next, talked about. Yeah. Well, there, <laughs> you seen it? Jane? You seen Not it? Yet. Not yet. Now we're talking about okay. um, some some uh, the um, artist Mac, Mac Binion. Do you know yeah, MacArthur? Sure, sure. Yeah, so he's an old friend, and mm -hmm. um, he's doing a show works from the seventies, putting together a show. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, so he asked for one of those paintings. So yeah. I have about you know I mean those paintings did you know I I, en I ended up selling almost all of them, but kept about. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I think I kept 10, two got destroyed, and I have the balance of them. And, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're interesting to look back at, you know. Yeah, and just the other night, uh, we were at uh, House and Worth talking about Jack Whitten. So no. obviously the context of the show that Katie Siegel and David Reed did, High Time, Hard Time, mm -hmm. painting in New York from 1967 to 75, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where the claim of that opinion was so intense that everyone were, in a way, taking the back burner because geometric minimal sculpture was the more prominently yeah, so. visible. Yeah. Um, Dorothea has been one of the yeah. participants, yeah, yeah. doing all kind of experimenting with material and on the floor and on the corner of the wall and her show at, uh, of course, was it six? The, was 72? Yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, at Klaus Curtis Place Biker Gallery. And there were other people who were punching holes through painting. Yeah. yeah. You know, and w w how did, what, how did that, was a relationship from your work at that time to what everyone else was doing, Johanna? Well, I was, you know, taking it all in, and, and um, I think at a certain point, Certainly, at that point, I was looking a lot, at, you know, and, 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 and it was affecting those, the, the, you know, the geometric issue was out there, and it was so, yeah. it became something that, that, um, that, I, that I wanted to be involved with. As time went on, um, you know, as, the, as my work evolved, different things became more important to me, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and I began... Um, I, I, I guess I, I spent a lot of time in Europe. I became interested in, um, you know, paintings in place. You yeah. Know, and, like and fresco. Like fresco, yeah. you know, um, mm -hmm. mosaics, Mosaic, and, yeah. you know, uh, Alhambra, you name it. Just the, you know, Padua. All, all, all those experiences, um, which were so, uh, you know, complex. And yeah. I thought, yeah. you know, um, give, given the fact that we don't all get a church to paint in or to yeah. paint, uh, yeah. um, that I, I, beca I became more, more interested in, in things like the altarpieces where you have, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. multiple panels that 
um, tell a story, and yeah. you, you know the the artist moves you through the space of the painting, um, mm -hmm. you know, with color and mm -hmm. shape and everything. But you're, it's really like animated, you yes. know. It's yeah. just like a like a, yeah. like kind of like a little film or something. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so uh, at that time, my the work got more gestural, and 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 also I began making things with many, 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 many panels. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is like all all of these things. I mean, the thing that I, that remained always, I think, um, part of me and part of my desires, you know, in 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 making things was was the need to kind of move beyond or extend the rectangle in some way, extend yeah. the space yeah. of the painting. Yeah. And and I and and that's really why I ended up making these these paintings, the yeah, curvature. Which, it was about extending space. Really. Which, uh, I mean, remarkable that um, in the spring salon, I think it was 1943, when Mondrian was on the Jura, in which um, he came upon an early Pollock. It's called stenographic figure, mm -hmm. now belong to MoMA collection, but it was a Guggenheim for a while. And he make an incredible remark. Actually, Barbara Rose wrote an essay for Art Magazine. It's a remarkable essay. How Mondrian anticipate Pollock, since he's the one who brought cubism to the logical conclusion, mm -hmm. reduce it to straight line, horizontal, and vertical. So therefore, the form extend beyond the canvas. So it became architecture, uh, yeah. architectural. Yeah. So he anticipated Pollock would do the same by having the, the canvas be in the floor and so on. There, henceforth, the beginning of Earth art. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dorothea was picking on it, doing the same in her work at the time. Mm -hmm. So my point is, interestingly, the idea of extending beyond that, you talk about um, periphery vision, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the same thing when I also uh, thought of how the Kunin relate to the notion of content. You mentioned content. Content is a glimpse, according to the Kunin, at least in the context when he was talking about the landmark show of the Women's Series in 1953 at Sydney Janus. None of the work was sold. Of course, it was Maya Shapiro who, who wrote to Alfred Moore and urged him to buy at least one of them. Woman won. So that's how it was So Five months after the show ended, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Get back to you, mm -hmm. to, to the whole point here. Content the glimpse meant like you being entering into um, an apartment. You enter the door, you're being greeted by your, you know, someone. You're talking to that person in the glimpse. You see somebody sitting in the corner or standing in the corner. Right. But it's not clear. Yeah. You just felt yeah. the present. Yeah. And how does that relate to your own vision being? Completely. <laughs> oh, OK. I mean, it does. It really, you know, Elaborate it's, it's on so that. interesting. You know, I think that de Kooning was really interesting that way. And also, even just things like it's making me think about Bernard, you know, mm -hmm. because Bernard does that. You know, there are these, yes. you know, there are these very developed areas in his paintings. And then all of a sudden, there'll be this little thing over here, you know, this like bare, you know, almost like a, you know, um, a hint of a of a of a person, or yeah. a hint of a, you know, and it's and it kind of um, yeah, it is the way you see, you know, you have mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. have things happening over here and things happening over here, but you're focused here, but you're aware of them, right. and and um, and they're part, you know, they're part of the experience of the moment, and um, so you know the the you know the to the way I think about the paintings. Um, is that they're what I can take in at yeah. a given moment, yeah. but they're part of something that's mm -hmm. that continues, you know, that's continuing, and yeah. so I I want them to feel like that, you know, in, in some way, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as though as though the space, as though the light is kind of going to continue yeah. beyond yeah. the beyond the the edges. Huh. Um, does that mean when you apply the color, Joanna, it varies in terms of 
many layers thinly, and how is it's uh, the 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 interplay between opacity and transparency. It also relates so much to how edges were painted, get painted. So is that part of the whole equilibrium of the painting? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, my idea was, you know, in making the the shapes was to make something where everything was in a state of movement. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> because that's what I was. That's sort of what I feel. Yeah. I feel everything is in flux. Yeah. You know, everything is changing. Everything is. So the so then the light has to do the same thing, you know, yeah. in the painting. So <clears throat> so the so the the you know what I and what I try to do is have the painting have undertones, mm -hmm. overtones, undertones, undertones, not you know, tonal undertones, undertones. Like so so if you take one color, you know, and then you 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 know, come over with a very thin layer of another color, mm -hmm. you get, it's different than if you do that thin low, thin coat over white. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you have a, it, it resonates in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I mean, you know, this is not new. <laughs> this is like, you know, this is a form of glazing. And yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, when I, like this last um, summer, I was uh, in a part of Italy and there was an amazing, um, Masolino cycle um, that I was, you know, able to see and visit a whole bunch of times, and um, you know, it was just so uh, moving how how incredibly um, rich and complex the color was because you could see all of the coats underneath. You could mm -hmm. see this amazing, you know, nothing was just a color. It was. It was everything was interacting with everything else. So, right. you know, through this through these glazing sort of things, you know, processes that that he used. Um, so, you know, that's how I sort of approach the color. So there's kind, you know, I mean, I think the color has to, you know, goes from warm to sometimes it goes from warm to cold. Sometimes it goes from light to dark. Sometimes it goes. I'll mix in, you know. Um, uh, something to vary, um, you know, a, a yellow, for instance, as it passes from one part of the painting to another. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of, you know, sort of changes the space, it changes the depth of the painting, mm -hmm. and it also kind of creates a sense of movement, like something is moving through, yeah. you know. And, and, and so it's, it's just many different layers built up. You know, and, yeah. and then in some of the paintings, not so much these. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, actually here. You know, I mean, there's, there are areas which are, like this is very, um, if you, it's hard to see sometimes when the light is, you know, this good. Um, I have very, I have light that comes booming in one side of my studio. So I can see things, um, you know, kind of obliquely and, um, and, 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 and I get into making areas that are very matte mm -hmm. and then areas which are shiny. And I can see that in the studio. Sometimes when you get it into a space, you have to be standing on the so one side or another yeah. to, really, to really see that, you know? Yeah. But that yeah. interests me. And because, because actually, um, when you look at the work in natural light, when I, when I made the show at Wiesbaden, it was a complete revelation. I mean, some, sometimes, I mean, I had one painting that was shocking, yeah. you know, for me to see. Um, there was a passage in it that just looked completely different, and it was a, sort of this pink, which I had painted in my studio. I thought it was a cold pink. Man, it got in the space, and you know, the, because the the natural light just yeah. brought out all the blues. Yeah. And and it was like I I, I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know that this is a good thing, <laughs> but, but it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Carl Carl Jensen, one of your former students at Hunter, mm -hmm. and I was just looking at the edges of things, how it changes sometimes. It's very clean, mm -hmm. um, and all the time it changes along the way. It's very irregular, mm -hmm. but at time, even looking at this luminous yellow edges here, Joanna, there's a re 
There's a reveal under layer mm -hmm. that coming through, or for example, a hue of yellow mm -hmm. along the edge here that glow that below curvy linear, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's like th that creates a sense of volumetric in a way, response. I mean, that's yeah. sort of allude yeah. to more three-dimensional form. It's not all absolute flatness. Am I right? Is that intentional? Yeah, I, I yeah. don't, I don't, I don't mean it necessarily to become three D, but yeah. you know, but yeah. but yeah, I mean, I want to expand the field of the spatial field, right. you know, in any way I can, you know, that that, that so, you know, um, so so some sometimes, um, you know, these sub layers get completely hidden and then sometimes you know I, I will allow them to be seen because they end up kind of creating a, a kind of interesting tension you know mm -hmm. or vibration you know yeah. in, in the work you know. well I mean we one more question we're going to open up to you immediately um, one question in terms of shape canvas um, I have interviewed Ron Gorchoff. I have done the same thing with Elizabeth Murray. There is definitely a, a, a strong narrative in their work. To Gorchoff, it's maybe even spiritual. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to accept it, but it's definitely there. I always felt, I mean, in, re, in repudiating or respond to what was happening, um, dealing with sculpture, you know, he managed to do that in the three-dimensional structure and yet still be able to paint. But to me, sometimes those irregular, dissimilar two marks implies, I don't know, some kind of stigmata or wounds, and mm -hmm. which what I just saw now the Schnabel show is all about that, wounds and, mm -hmm. you know, mark making mm -hmm. that reveals so much about the body and whatnot. Uh, and we know about Elizabeth mm -hmm. being resolutely about urban energy. Mm -hmm. um, don't want to simplistic <laughs> niche and read it in the work here, but I mean, it just, it's just impossible to place you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What is it? You know, all the things that we just talk about and, and it's still very hard to mediate. You know, all of these things is all there simultaneously. So that's a good place that we can actually open to everyone here. Um, Hi, Alan. How are you? Hi. You look good. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned Gorshop and Zepet Marie. But what's very particular, exceptionally rare in American art, I would say, uh, with Joanna, is that the work is graceful, has a lot of joy, and it is uplifting. And I am sick, and so when I came to see the show, I felt like I almost the same experience that I would go to Matisse uh, in Nice, or uh, uh, the cuts out and the joy of color. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is very, I uh, want to ask you, uh, Joanna, would you agree and are you not afraid to accept the work gracefulness in your work or is this something very un-American, I don't know. There, 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 is, there is what? The word gracefulness. Gracefulness. I, I accept it. I mean, I... <laughs> 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 no, I thank you, Ella. That's very nice. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, I think that um, all of these issues of, uh, of um, a, 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 how something appears, you know, whether it's, you know, how, how, we, how we think about it. I mean, I, th I think a lot of times... Uh, there's a suspicion of things which one could say would be beautiful, you know, uh, or a beauty, or dealing with beauty, for instance. You know, I think it's very out. And I don't set about trying to make something beautiful or dealing with beauty. 
and I don't think beauty has to do with prettiness, you know, or with, with um, taste or with any of those elements. I think, I, I think beauty can be really um, dark and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, but I, I, I just think that what is important is, is that how, how something becomes whole, you know, is, mm -hmm. is to me what's, what I look for in art, in, in art of all kinds, you know. Um, this feeling of all, how, how something um, is, is put together in, in a very precise and, and amazing way, I guess. You know, that's sort of, that's how, I, that's how I think about it, really. So graceful, I'll accept graceful, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Yes, John. I loved when you were, John, I loved when you were describing like taking these photographs in 360 degrees and pasting them all together to try to get the horizon. So it occurred to me that mapping might be a term that would be really applicable to your work in terms of like establishing kind of discourse surrounding the work. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like you're mapping something? I mean, I could go on and on about this, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it would be more interesting if you did, if you um, could think about mapping. I, I know, I don't know. I, I, I think, I feel like I'm locating, you know. Uh, um, you know, I, I feel like, um, I, I don't know, I don't know about mapping. I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that, that um, what, what, I, what I feel is that I am, taking, I'm trying to find a, a, how can I put it, sort of a, a, a place of rest in something that's constantly moving, expanding, contraction, shifting, you know, and, and that, that has to do with, uh, you know, how I put the things together, it's this, it's the stance of each painting, you know, it's about a centering, you know, um, I think more than mapping, but I may not be understanding what you're saying in terms of how you're using the term. I don't know, is that it? When you you when you say mapping, you map, you mean like walking along, around, along, claiming a certain spatial no, relationship. No, just thinking about when you were talking about like extending beyond, mm -hmm. and like when we want to go kind of beyond where it is, we got to have a map of some kind uh, when we go outside uh, of the boundaries uh, uh -huh. of what we know, and so like like as I was looking at these, I was thinking about how they kind of start to map that nonlinear dimension with those curves and so on. And mm -hmm. so like there were just fragments of a thought coming together for me around mm -hmm. that of like you trying to locate a space mm -hmm. that became the shape of your canvases and that procedure there had a process embedded in it that seemed something like mapping, mm -hmm, like what mm -hmm. one would do in making a map. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you would, I mean, some of the most interesting maps that um, have come out in recent times are from this cartography project at the University of Chicago, are all Native American maps, you know, mm. where somebody walked 800 miles and yeah. they got there and someone goes, draw the map and they just sit down and... Or, or the Australian, you know, the yeah. Aboriginal or... You maps, know, and, you know, and, and, so... Yeah, mm -hmm. and the Sikh, those, you know, maps of, uh, of uh, what is it, of the universe, or I can't remember, but there are just these huge things which have to do with, um, you know, all these different aspects of consciousness and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's... Uh, I, I, th I think that... You know that the whole, the whole, the drawing in them. You know the drawing in them. 
uh, is, is like, to, to me, it's like a, trying to make a continuum, you know, mm -hmm. a continuum with, a continuum within the thing, the, the drawing to the edge, and then the, the, the color <laughs> takes it outside. Mm -hmm. You know, the color stretches it outside. That's kind of how I think about it. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'll try and put this in the form of a question. Can you hear me? Is yeah. it working? Yeah. Close up. Hold it yeah. up like this? That's good, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you know, this talk about uh, content is really interesting. Um, I actually read a definition of the difference between subject matter and content on the back of a jazz album, and I don't remember what it was. It was a great definition. and. They distinguished between the choices that the artist makes about you know, their influences, what, how they choose to work, what they're trying to do, and then content is actually what they do with it and how they work with that stuff. You mm -hmm. know? And the thing that was so interesting about that is in relation to what you said about Bernard, mm. because I always consider him to be like the master of reconsideration. Like, you look at him and everything in those paintings were always, you feel like he thought about them over and over. Like, he, the reason he painted his house is because he was just looking at the teapot, like, all day long. And when he painted, it was like the 50 millionth time he'd thought about the teapot. You know, it's like reading Proust. Exactly like reading Proust, yeah. looking at Bernard. Yeah. It seems like an endless labyrinth of rethinking. Yes. You know? Yeah. And so, in relation to your work, um, I, the content, it would seem to me, to be this reconsideration. The, the, the way the lines, you know, form themselves, the way that the colors are reconsidered in relation to the other colors. Very different from Ryan Gorchuk, who is admittedly a great painter, but you feel that, um, a, uh, for he, an example, is those paintings feel executed. You know, there are very specific decisions made. And the content in your work, you may or may not agree with me, is this kind of reconsideration, mm -hmm. this constant reconsideration. Which I think it's interesting that um, Bernard is so popular among painters for mm -hmm. that reason, the same way that these are, you know, they're so thought through. I suppose mm -hmm. another equivalent is the difference between the, the readerly and the writerly, where mm -hmm. you know, a piece of writing that's constantly reworked and thought about mm -hmm. what, it, what it is exactly that's being done mm -hmm. here, this, what I'm working with. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, he had things that he came back to after years and years and years. He would, you know, have a painting and it be sitting against the wall, you know, and maybe five years later he'd come back and add a little something over here or, or, or do something to it. Um, and, and uh, you know, the other person that was mentioned earlier, Mondrian, you know, I mean, this, this constant um, uh, adjustments, you know, in the painting over and over, you know, these little incremental sort of adjustments to, to, to lines and to the way the space, you know, within the lines is drawn. And um, I mean, I've, I, that just amazes me, you know, and, and, um, and I feel very close to that in, the, in my process. I think you're very right, you know. I mean, they, and, and I will say, you know, that, that my, my paintings often go through enormous changes, you know, just really enormous changes. It's one of the reasons that I, that I, um, that I have continued to work with acrylic paint, because I can, you know, I don't have to wait for ages for things to dry to make the changes. And, um, and, um, and, you know, and I, I, I just think all the changes of a painting are always there. You know, you, they're there, they're present in the painting. No matter how it turns out, the, the prior lives are there and sort of give it a kind of a resonance, you know. Joe, you sound like an art critic. What you really <laughs> painted to. No, but the it's best true. Kind. It's, it's true because um, I remember Franz Clyde one make a remark about Bonnard's nude in the tub. He said, that nude would never be able to get out that bathtub. <laughs> you know? So I, I, 
<laughs> I think that reconsideration is about slowing down the looking process too, yes. for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's the difference between the resolute flatness in the architectural experience that one see confronts with Bonnet Newman. When you come close, you don't have that. So it's very fixed from a certain distance to experience that in Newman. Whereas in your opinion, I think we have both. You could see from a distance, but you also have the same satisfaction when you come close. And the edges, the colors, and the shape, the, all of it. Um, my question is, no, I should have more questions come in. Yes, Kathy? Joanne, I've been sitting here listening to your every word, staring right at you, but also at the painting right behind you. And I agree, it is expanding the space around the rectangle. But what is really holding me in there is something I've never heard you talk about. It's the figure ground reversal. Mm -hmm. the, that yellow on top becomes a shape, and so does the pink. And why don't you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you mention it, um, <laughs> um, this, this is actually what I was talking about a little bit in the photographs that I was taping together and seeing this, this um, flipping back and forth between what was solid and what, what, was, what was light and what was solid, what was, mm. um, you know, so that is very important to me, you know, um, and this, um, this constant exchange, you know, between, um, I mean, in, in these photographs, this, this constant exchange between, I mean, you know, bet between uh, the forms that were happening on, on, on Earth, the forms that were happening in the sky, and then, uh, you know, the, co the color or the light changing them spatially, you know, in a positive, negative kind of way, a very positive, but negative kind of way, but al also in, in, in terms of their weight, you know, so so in, in the paintings, um, you know, in, in, in my paintings, I'm, I'm always sort of trying to, um, you know, kind of have those um, spaces, you know, the spaces within the drawn lines and things like that, um, kind of, you know, move, move in and out, fluctuate. Um, in a sense. I don't know if that answers your question. But it is, it, it's very important to me, the positive and negative thing. And, and the proportions of the shapes allow that to happen, I think. Um, if you get the right proportion uh, and the right color relationship, they slide, you know, more easily, I think. Um, this is a general question. Um, uh, earlier, somebody was talking about gracefulness. Yeah, I feel like the work has really achieved this sense of grace. Uh, and it makes me feel so good when I see it. And I think when I first saw work uh, that's part of this body of work, I just couldn't take my eyes off. Just, wow, what is this? It makes me feel really good. I really want to come here to speak about it and see the work. Um, so it's just a random question, but are there any kind of uh, new ideas or preoccupations in your mind that you're trying to weave into your work as you move forward? And if so, purely out of curiosity, uh, anything you can share? Like where do you, where do you take Oh, thank you. Uh, and I'm just curious, like, where is your mind and where are you looking ahead? I have so many things that I'm that I'm working on that actually are, are different. You know, um, 
and the paintings that I'm, I'm going to be showing at Locks are, are, are different again. You know, so these paintings, um, this painting, the yellow painting, is the, is the, is the most recent in this, in this group of things. Um, and the, you know, I, 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 I think as I've, I, you know, I don't really approach my work in a kind of um, linear way. So I'm constantly circling back, you know. Mm -hmm. I move forward and then I circle back uh, frequently. So it, uh, but the, uh, the, the paintings that I, the more recent paintings actually have um, a great deal of, uh, I, I, I wanted them to feel kind of like drawings on the wall. So there's a lot of, so the wall really moves into them. There's a lot of neutral areas in the, in the paintings, um, and, or very high, high value um, uh, paintings, so that they, um, so they're much more permeable, you know, in a funny way. And um, so that kind of, you know, that's a direction that I'm going in, you know. Um, doesn't mean I won't, you know, shift back to things. Also, there are certain paintings that, you know, just the configuration um, is something that ends up being uh, something I want to explore further. Most of them are unique configurations, but every once in a while I hit on uh, a, some kind of configuration that makes me want to kind of... Um, you know, it suggests um, other ways of, of approaching it. So, um, you know, I can't say I wouldn't revisit some of, some of these shapes, you know, in, in, in different ways. But, but the, it's, it's interesting you ask that because I, I do think that um, the, the way I work in, in, and in, uh, the fact that I'm doing a lot of drawing late, lately um, has, I, I just sort of feel like there's so many possibilities. So it's, you know, and, and, um, and uh, I don't think I could work if I didn't feel that. I don't think I could work. Hmm. I, I get a lot of energy, creative energy. Oh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so I, I was hoping to hear you say something like that. Maybe we'll take uh, one more? Yes, sir. Yes, brother. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, when you were talking about your painting, and the first thing that I felt very much attracted to your painting was the shapes, which was, are different and wonderful um, in the way they also um, managed to do as well with the color. But you mentioned a couple of um, instances that in your travels you were admiring or, um, oriental art. Uh, you mentioned Alhambra and Chinese landscape. And I'm very interested in, in you expanding a little bit on that and how that has uh, influenced your work, that different vision non-Western? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I can, um, <laughs> how, how, how to be specific about that. Um, I mean, the Chinese landscape painting has really been interesting to me because of the way that the figure is in relation to the landscape. Tiny. You know, and completely um, enveloped, and and um, so the relationship of of figure to to landscape is something that really interests me, and 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 that's really again how the shapes come about in a way. You know, they're they're. I, I feel like I never wanted to, I'm, I'm not interested in drawing the figure, you know, I, it, you know within a painting. But I, but I feel that, that 
what I'd like to try to do is, is give a sense through the scale and the composition that you're there, you know, that you're in the painting, you know, somehow. And, and I think the shape, because I treat it, I treat it as, a, as, as my peripheral vision, you know, in a sense. It's what, you know. So, so now the, you know, the Alhambra is just the Alhambra. It's just, a, you know, I, I don't know. It's just overwhelming. And I think about it all the time. Um, uh, and certain kinds of shapes and forms, you know, sometimes will, will come out of that. But it just, it just, um, you know, there's something, you know, there's something to being in a place that, that you can't replicate. You know, the painting in place or, 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 you know, that kind of thing in place. And, it, you know, I would love to be able to bring the complexity and resonance, resonance of that experience into the work. I don't, I don't know that it's possible because I think it's one, you know, if you're in a space where every aspect of the place is, you know, working and, you know, engaging you, um, and surrounding you, it is a world. You know, it's a world. You're, you're, you're entering into a whole world, and and an, this is still an object. You know, but I want to try to make it be as, you know, I want to try to have it take you in as much as possible, and and to be, you know, also as expansive as possible. I mean, yeah. which um, continuing what you just asked. Um, this will be the last question um, <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> no, there's, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of centralization within the form. Sometimes they expand a bit more, but most often they're trying to gather the energy to containment, a form of containment. Somehow, I'm thinking at the moment of Le Diver of Leger, you know, is very much centralized in the middle. But the form is not determined. In other words, you can turn and see it from all sides. Yeah. And I think that sense of, of, of um, potential viewership mm -hmm. is something that you feel, even though these are resolutely installed as they appear to be. But you also feel that they can be the other way can be seen from different perspective. Is that possible? In other words, my question is, what about sense of gravity, Joanna? The sense of gravity? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think, I think that they're, they're both forces, you know. They're both, there's, there's buoyancy mm -hmm. and gravity, you know, right. in right. them. And so certain paintings, like maybe this painting is more about a kind of, well, I don't know. I mean, I think there, it's, a, it's about trying to create a balance between the two. And, yeah. and you know, I, uh, and I, I think that the, um, I don't know, uh, per, perhaps the fact that a lot of times, you know, when I get these things back from the fabricator, yeah. before they have any images on them, yeah. I often say, Jesus, what the hell was I thinking? You know, because they're because they're kind of really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're not they're not symmetrical in yeah. any way, and sometimes they they're just unbalanced. Yeah. You know, and it's the you know then then it's the drawing within them that balances them. Yeah. You know, so so in a way that that's kind of. Mm -hmm. Maybe the center kind of that you're talking yeah. about. I don't know. That's the perfect way of ending. Thank you for coming. We can chat afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>